Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Una Daly again, the uh, director of the Community College Consortium for OER, and I want to welcome you to our December webinar um, on the impact of OER adoption on cost outcomes and stakeholder presentation perceptions. Excuse me. <laughs> Um, and this is our last webinar for um, the calendar year 2018 um, and um, we're very glad that you could join us for this and I imagine that many of you have joined us for um, our other monthly webinars. Uh, very quickly, um, these webinars are recorded um, and we share those um, on our, uh, the, our homepage. So, if you want to go back and check on something or if you have colleagues who couldn't attend today, uh, we usually have these posted within 48 hours uh, with the slides as well. We do send it out for captioning. All right, so I'm very excited to have um, this particular uh, webinar on research findings um, from both American University, which is a, a University back in Washington, D.C., a private university. Um, <laughs> David will correct me if that's uh, wrong, but um, actually quite a select university. Um, and there was research done there on how textbook costs impact that demographic. And, um, and then if, secondly, we will hear from uh, Regina Gong at Lansing Community College on what's been happening the last three years um, of OER adoption at her college, how that's affecting student outcomes, uh, retention, and other uh, data. So both really great um, findings for, for our community to be aware of. So at this point, I wanna give uh, David and Regina a moment to say hello to everyone uh, before we uh, get into the main part of this. Uh, so David, would you like to say hello to everyone? David is the online learning trainer and curriculum designer at American University in Washington, DC. Uh, yeah, thanks, Una. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am, that's my, I guess, official title. Instructional designer is basically what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I currently work at AU's law school. I used to be at our Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning up until about six months ago, uh, where I ran our open education program there. Um, so we had small stipends that we would give out to faculty to encourage OER adoption. And so the research findings that I'll be presenting today are kind of like the precursor to that. Um, when the program was first getting started, we were trying to just gather student data about um, textbook buying habits. So I look forward to talking about that soon. Thank you for joining us today, David. And next up is Regina Gong, who uh, is a longtime presenter with us at CCCOER. She's on our executive council, um, as well as her day job, where she is a librarian and the OER project manager at Lansing Community College. Regina? Thank you, Una, and thank you, David. Um, welcome, everyone, and I'm, you know, happy to be here and talk about the um, research that I've um, done um, with regards to OER here at LCC. So, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Regina. And um, thank you to all of you who've been introducing yourself in the chat window. Um, and um, we have quite a nice uh, set of folks from around the country. I see just about um, all corners of the country are, are covered here. And if you haven't had a chance, please do introduce yourself in the chat window um, if, if you'd like to. Um, we love to see who's attending. And um, before we get started with the main presentation, I'm just going to go through my usual uh, little marketing slides. <clears throat> the Community College Consortium for OER has been around now for 11 years. We celebrated our 10-year um, anniversary last year, actually. Um, and our mission remains largely the same as when we were founded. It's expanding awareness and access to open educational resources. Uh, we are a community of practice for open education, and so we're all about supporting faculty choice and development, which is what these webinars are about. Uh, but ultimately, our goal is student success. And um, I know that both of our speakers are, are going to um, address that today and how um, OER can help with that. Um, so I want to just 
to show you our membership map. If you're not on here, we'd love to have you. We have uh, now 75 members in 32 states, uh, Grayson Community College in Denison, Texas. Texas just joined us this month, and so we're excited to have them uh, with us as well. And 11 of those uh, memberships are statewide memberships. So <clears throat> today we are gonna hear from uh, the two from David and Regina about student impact, uh, the impact of textbook costs on uh, students from um, a financial perspective, um, also how it affects their behavior. Um, what classes uh, do they choose to take or not take and how that might affect their uh, completion rates. Um, Regina is going to go into more detail about uh, student learning outcomes. Um, I think you'll be really excited to see her data where they're able to compare um, how students did the previous year uh, with the same instructors using commercial textbooks versus how, how students did the following year, same instructor, but with OER textbooks. And she also has information about retention. Um, so really some, some great data from Regina and David. And, and I think, um, I'm not sure if this was mentioned, but both Regina and David were open ed group fellows uh, in the 2017-18 years. And um, David's um, data has been published in a, in a journal article and Regina's will be soon. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn this over to um, to David Rose from American University. Great, so I'm gonna share my screen. Perfect, we can see it. Okay, great. Oops, sorry, let me just set up my, my notes here too, okay. <laughs> Um, great. So, um, like uh, I've already introduced myself. Well, again, my name is David Rose. I'm at American University, which is a private school, as Una mentioned. Um, I this research was part of the Open Ed Group Research Fellowship, um, and I'm also working with the Open Textbook Network um, as a boot camp instructor. Um, our uh, OER certificate program, which we are starting uh, early 2019. So maybe some of you are in that, which would be great. Um, so the survey that we developed um, was, like I mentioned, to get a better sense of the pervasiveness of textbook buying habits or lack thereof at AU. Um, and the general idea, which I'll get into more, was that OER research um, has largely been focused at state schools and community colleges um, and the, the findings that support OER research um, that say students aren't buying textbooks, um, would that same concept hold true at a, at a private school that's much more expensive? And so, <laughs> uh, the short answer, no. Um, I will get into more details, but private schools are not exempt from um, student concerned about textbook buying habits. And that's it. So thank you for having me, Una, and I'll be on my way. Um, that's obviously a joke. So, all right, we're <laughs> laughing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So a um, little bit of background: the Open American Program is what our OER grant program is called at AU, um, and it started in about 2013. And um, like I mentioned, the idea was to kind of get some some um, solid data that we can use to support why we're funding this. Um, and about 10 years ago, the uh, financial aid model at AU changed to be largely merit-based to be uh, more um, need-based. So it, it changed from about 70% merit-based awarding to 70% need-based rewarding. And so that didn't change the uh, economic, or it didn't change the, um, the academic profile of our incoming students, but it did change the economic profile quite a bit, as you might expect. Um, and so with that came students into this very expensive private school in a very expensive city um, that started to voice concerns about affordability and textbook buying habits. And so the Center for Teaching Research and Learning, where I used to work, 
um, decide to allocate a small portion of their budget to support OER adoption, um, which has been proven through research, largely out of um, this open ed group fellowship to be a solution to student affordability issues. Um, and I, before I go any further, I should mention that my co-researcher and um, author in this paper is Lindsay Murphy, who's pictured here. She currently works at Portland State University. Um, and she was actually my predecessor to leading the Open American program in the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. And it was actually her that was the one at AU at the time the survey was administered. So she deserves the lion's share of credit for this. Um, it just so happens that I'm the one that still currently works at AU. Um, so yeah, we wrote the paper together. Um, and if you are in the Portland area, you should definitely look her up. Uh, so a little bit of more background on the AU student demographics. Um, these, the national averages um, are from College Board and NCES, and I have links to the specific places that I found them um, that will be in the slides once uh, this gets distributed after the webinar is over. So if you wanna double check these numbers, please do, because um, I think as we're all aware, these numbers are sometimes kind of not consistent. Um, so anyways, uh, this is in 2015 when the survey was administered again. Um, students receiving need-based financial aid is roughly the same at AU as national. Um, the two that, concert, that are, I find most interesting is the discrepancy in the last two between 52% um, of AU students used loans to pay for their education versus 34 nationally, and about 18% of our students were Pell eligible versus 34 nationally. Um, so. I'm sure a lot of you are much smarter can read into this. I don't know exactly what that means, but I guess my best guess would be that, you know, a lot of our students maybe didn't make the cut for Pell eligible, but even though you don't meet that demarcation, college is still very unaffordable for, um, I guess, the quote unquote middle class who uh, wouldn't normally be considered in the Pell eligible financially um, needy group. So just a little bit of background on our students. And as Una mentioned, this was recently published in um, Open Praxis in the latest issue. There's a bit.ly link here if you want to go to it directly or you can just Google Open Praxis and find the latest issue. And um, Lindsay and I's paper will be there. So the findings that I'll be presenting now will be all from this paper, but if you want to read the whole thing, which I encourage you to do, um, please go check it out. Okay, so in Regina's study, which you'll hear um, in a second, you know, like she has control groups and it's very much more scientific than what we did. Um, and um, so our methodology, um, our very unscientific methodology. So in fall 2015, um, we surveyed 13 courses across undergraduate levels. Um, textbook prices varied. Um, and the, the courses that we identified, it wasn't in any kind of uh, research rigorous method. It was just kind of um, courses and professors that we had access to that were willing to distribute our, our surveys to students. Um, students were incentivized with two $25 gift cards and the method of survey capture was dependent on the professor. So they either did it in person in class or they just emailed them a link, it varied. Um, and so in the end, we had about 110 responses, which was about 30% response rate for all the students that received the survey in one form or, or another. So uh, as I mentioned, our main research question was, um, there are about 4 million private school students across the country. This represents about 20% of higher education. Um, and so there's you know, a ton of research that shows that students don't buy textbooks, um, and that OER is a potential solution to that. But this research, as I mentioned, has been largely focused at public universities. Um, and at AU, there is a general perception, less so amongst faculty, but to a greater extent among administration that, um, you know, that's not a problem here type of thought, you know? Um, these are students that have a cost of attendance of about $60,000 a year, which includes tuition, room and board, um, books and supplies, so all in about sixty thousand um, <clears> dollars, and tuition is you know forty five to fifty of that, um, and so 
the survey is largely over, or uh, sorry, excuse me, the research, existing research is largely overlooking this 20% of students. And so can we kind of fill in a gap there was our primary research question. So I am curious, you don't have to um, type in the chat. You can if you want, but I'll, I'll stop talking for about 20 seconds. And if you just want to read over these uh, little quizzes and just think to yourself what you think the answer might be here. I think our, our audience is pretty advanced in, in OER, so you might know these and it might be easy. All right, so from 1977 to 2015, textbook prices rose by over a thousand percent. And that number is over three times the rate of inflation. And this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, I've seen this quoted as three to four times in different places, um, but just generally, I guess. Um, the College Board estimates that in 2017-18, undergraduates could expect to pay almost $1,200 for books and supplies alone, and roughly two thirds of students don't purchase required textbooks due to cost concerns. And so that two thirds of students is kind of the, the main number that we are looking at. Um, this number has been repeated in a number of different sources, which I'll go through fairly quickly here. The largest one, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, is Florida Virtual Campus. They've done this survey three different times, the most recent being in 2016. They had over 20,000 students respond, 67% or two thirds um, have not purchased a required textbook because of cost. Again, Florida Virtual Campus in 2012, 64%, Florida Virtual Campus in 2010, 65%. Uh, student Pergs have done a number of surveys measuring the same thing, and they found that 65% of students in 2014 didn't purchase a required textbook due to costs. Student Pergs in 2011, 70% of students. Um, so th that's, that's, that's what we were working with, right? That's what all the existing research said. And again, for the millionth time, I'll repeat it, that the, uh, you know, the, the focus of this survey was that this largely did not take into account private schools. So another quick 10 second pause, just think to yourself, compared to these, all these numbers, what would you expect AU student textbook buying habits? Um, did students buy textbooks more often, less often, or roughly the same? All right, we got a few, few same guesses. <laughs> I'm sure that's probably what most people are thinking. And the big reveal, yes, so, like kind of weirdly shocking, the exact same two thirds number, 67% um, of students at American University in the fall 2015 reported that they had not bought a required textbook at one point or another because it was too expensive. Um, and if you just think, uh, remember back to that little guessing game that we just did, the um, college board had also estimated that they, uh, expect students to be spending about $1,200 per year on textbooks. Um, that was not true at AU. Students have spent about half of that. Um, and this number, our 577, 600-ish number, that has also been um, found in other surveys as well. Um, the Florida Virtual Campus survey, again, 2016, found roughly the same thing. And then another researcher, um, Hill, in 2015, found a similar number. Um, so again, just showing that, and that, that college board number is coming from schools self-reporting um, what, what they project students to be spending on their required textbooks. So the point being, students aren't buying them. All right, so again, getting to a little bit more of the specifics of our findings, um, we had, so there's a, a perception of value that seems to become pretty apparent. Um, so we asked students in general, when you prepare for tests or exams, what percentage of studying do you vote to each of the following? And the dark gray box on the right is textbooks. And as you can see, that was their least favorite method of preparing or studying. Um, and so 
generally there's, or, or you know, there, there's certainly some kind of, of value assessment going on. Um, so specific quotes, which I'll show some in a second, but specific quotes, you know, students said, uh, professors either don't test or rarely test on textbook material. Uh, if they do, it'll only be information discussed in class. Um, students said, some courses require expensive textbooks that you use infrequently. So students are, are making value judgments. And these value judgments are learned behavior. So these are some, um, these are some quotes from students that kind of imply some, some temporal time passage, right? Like they maybe used to buy books, but they have learned pretty quickly throughout their, their studies that it's not required. Um, so specifically, when analyzing responses by academic year, only 32% of freshmen reported that they decided not to buy a required textbook, while 75% of sophomores, juniors, and seniors reported doing so. Um, and again, that's, this is just a visual representation of those numbers. Um, much greater percentage of upperclassmen are not buying required textbooks because they are learning. It is not needed. And so this is um, when we imported the survey data into Qualtrics, we kind of, um, we, we tried to tag the free response questions as best as we could. Um, and you can kind of see the major themes with this chart that arise, obviously too expensive, don't buy, not use, those are the big ones. Um, the, the two that I find really interesting, um, I mean, obviously the, the third from the bottom, illegal downloads is, is a pretty big concern that's been you know talked about elsewhere that um, not only are students not buying textbooks, but indirectly, um, you know, we could be encouraging illegal behavior um, by having students find illegal PDFs elsewhere. But um, the two that I think are really interesting are, you know, there's personal privilege at 6.9% and family help at 3.5%. Um, so even students who did buy textbooks because they could, uh, I just think it's interesting that they're even students who are recognizing that they are coming from a place of, you know, relative privilege over their peers are still acknowledging that um, textbooks are, are prohibitive to some. Uh, and here's more quotes, just students diving deeper that um, they're acknowledging that not buying the book is having a negative consequence on their learning. Um, so uh, students are saying, you know, I find tech, uh, highlighting beneficial, um, but I still choose to rent rather than buy just because it's too expensive. Um, so just some quotes that we pulled here. Um, and again, uh, just more quotes, just because I, I find that really persuasive, um, kind of paints the story of what these students are going through. So again, students from a $50,000 a year school for tuition, um, people are saying, um, you know, th this one right in the middle, I don't make enough to spend it all on textbooks. Um, our, our findings, I don't, I, I don't think I have a slide in here, um, but our findings did show that um, students who spent less on textbooks worked more. Um, and I don't know if you can make a direct uh, correlation there, but um, you know, could certainly imply that you know students who who have to work more hours feel you know more more cost constrained. Um, that would make a lot of sense. Um, talking about stress um, takes away from other needs like food and rent, um, and then particularly these, these ones in the bottom that say I try to stay away from courses that I know require very expensive textbooks, or that first one that says I know people who have dropped out of classes because the book was too expensive. Um, and then so this is getting into larger concerns, right, that administration would be um, probably very concerned to hear if this was pervasive and systematic. Um, so in, in, in summation, I suppose, going back to um, my spoiler from the, from the very first slide, are private schools exempt from student concerns about textbook costs? No. Um, our results were consistent with results found at public four and two year universities. Um, and uh, findings from those universities have, you know, demonstrated that textbooks are um, prohibitive for a lot of students and that 
OER or low cost textbook programs are a very viable solution to that. Um, so that same, um, that same connection could, I think, very easily be made at private universities as well. Um, and like I mentioned, the, the Open American program did start at AU in 2013. So it's been going for about five years now. Um, when I left in April to come to the law school, we had saved students over $500,000 um, in textbooks from our efforts there with the, the stipends to encourage faculty to adopt. Um, even if there was no future adoptions since I left, um, we probably would have reached um, a million dollars in student savings um, probably sometime in 2019. Uh, don't quote me on that though, because I'm, I'm not at the program anymore, so I can't give you specific numbers. So um, yeah, and so, uh, you know, students at AU resorted to the same coping mechanisms that students at community colleges and other low cost institutions, um, these coping mechanisms included not purchasing all required texts, um, relying instead on course reserves, illegal downloads, or never referencing the text at all. Um, our study also uh, suggests that the academic value of textbooks may be misaligned to the high price of textbooks, and that students experience uh, negative learning effects stemming from those high prices. Uh, so in terms of future research, um, one of our key things that we wanted to look at, um, whether it's us or, you know, some other private institution that wants to follow up on this, um, it's just has the inability or refusal to purchase textbooks by AU students also led to an inability, inability to enroll in courses they need as part of their degree program. Um, has time to degree completion been affected um, or even something more benign like student satisfaction in their degree program? Um, as a result of non-ideal courses due to textbook costs. Um, so this chart that you're seeing is comparing Florida virtual campus surveys and what we talked about, what I just talked about was that first line, right? That was kind of our big number of the students not buying textbook costs. Um, but the following, th uh, taking fewer courses, not registering for a specific course, um, obviously that has been demonstrated at public universities. Um, would the same hold true at private? Um, that would be something I would be interested in finding out. Because that, that's a, you know, maybe a fairly persuasive bargaining chip for administration um, when you start talking about revenue to the school being affected. Um, and so the last thing I want to leave you with is just this quote, um, Stein and her colleagues, um, I believe they're from uh, New Zealand, and we read their report as we were writing ours last year. Um, and it was just really helpful to us in kind of framing that they had a very similar uh, approach to their their research. Um, and the quote is just, uh, as you can see, textbooks may be developing into a systematic barrier to student learning. Um, and it's um, uh, you know, all of our jobs, right, that are, are here, that care about OER, that care about student success, to not let it be. Um, and just a thank to the um, Open Ed Group Fellowship, um, which Una mentioned, Regina and I um, were a part of, the 2017-18 uh, cohort. It's a super great group. If you have any interest at in all, I really encourage it. And to the Open Textbook Network, which uh, AU is a part of, they have also been extremely beneficial in uh, everything that we're doing at our school. Um, so I also could not recommend them more as well. well and so that is it for my section. Thank you, David. That was that was wonderful. And um, I just was made aware of that we have a couple of students in our audience today, which is wonderful. We don't always get students. We have students present with us once in a while. And I wonder if Mel or Kazu wanted to say hi, and if you, we could give you a minute or two just to say if what David has reported on seems uh, like it's the same at your community college in Oregon. I'm putting them on the spot because I didn't know they would be here today. Hello. 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 Is oh, this hi. working? Yeah, it's right there. Uh, yep, I think we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, me and Mel are students at Mount Hood Community College located in Gresham, Oregon. Um, I, I mean, yes, a lot of his information was definitely accurate, especially with students being or not being able to take classes especially because of textbook prices um, one of the major issues at our school is a lot of our science classes have very expensive textbooks so a lot of students cannot find an alternate to it 
And yeah, I mean. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, David, there was a few comments in the um, chat window from, um, many were from Rich Hirschman, and I wanna say, uh, welcome, Rich, uh, who um, is here from the National Association of Bookstores and is an active participant participant on our community email list as well. Um, and I didn't know if you wanted to address any of those comments, or you can also do that in the chat window as well, David. Okay. Um, sorry, I haven't looked at the, the chat yeah. window. Um, yeah, just take your time on that. Um, uh, because um, Rich had a lot of good information about um, how statistics are gathered by the bookstores as well and uh, by various organizations. So you can address that in the chat window. We can come back to it at the end. Sure. Um, great. And I think it, if, if there aren't any further questions, I didn't see any other specific questions um, for David. Um, we will move on to um, Regina's presentation. And then we'll come back at the end and have time for Q&A um, for, for both our presenters. So Regina, you can uh, go ahead and share your screen now. Okay, let me just... There we go. Okay, how's that? Perfect, and, and thank you, David. Great presentation and thank you, Regina. Thank you. Thank you, Una, and thank you, David. That was really, um, you know, an illuminating research that, that you've done at AU. Um, so just a bit of a context where I am um, situated right now. I, as, as I've sa said earlier, I am a librarian and I manage our OER project here at LCC. So we've started our um, OER project um, in 2015. So we are on our third year now um, of doing OER. And when we started in fall 2015, um, we did not provide any grants or stipends for our faculty. And um, it was only last year, last fall, when um, we got that half a million dollar um, allocation from our board of trustees. And I have been managing that, and we've been using that to um, support our faculty in the form of um, OER award. So our goals um, in terms of our OER initiative are, at LCC are twofold. So one is for our students to help them um, to help eliminate the barrier of textbook um, costs. Um, and as we saw, textbook costs is really a barrier for our students, whether you work or whether you are enrolled in um, a community college or a private university such as um, um, AU, American University. And um, another goal of our OER initiative is for our faculty um, so that they can explore um, new ways of delivering their um, uh, courses and also to um, improve their um, teaching and pedagogy through the use of OER. So this is just the numbers that we have so far. So as you can see, we have been progressing in terms of um, the numbers in our OER adoption. Um, so for fall, we really um, shoot up in terms of, of the number of courses and sections that are using OER. And so far, we have saved um, $2.2 billion for our students. But as you know, savings is not, um, uh, although it is important, there must be more to OER than just cost savings. And um, that is the question that we are trying to find out here at LCC. So, um, and that's the reason why um, I have done this um, research on OER. So the, the question that we, we really want to, to be answered is that, um, how do OER contribute to student success. Um, ultimately, we want to know whether they are effective and um, do they help our students learn. And um, I just want to mention that, like David, I also have a co-author um, for this research. 
I am co-authoring it with our um, director for assessment here at LCC. She works at um, our Center for, Doc, uh, for um, Data Science, and she's Dr. Karen Hicks. So unfortunately, she's unable to be um, with us today, but I just would like to acknowledge um, her um, help in doing this research. So as you know, most of the um, OER efficacy study, studies out there, uh, particularly those that were conducted by um, our fellow OER um, research group um, fellows, show that um, students assigned an OER have lower withdrawal and drop rates and are more likely to pass with a C or better grade. And in, and in addition, um, they have higher persistence and retention rate. So, CC, I would like to know, does, does, you know, do these findings hold true for us here um, at, uh, at the community college? And so, just a bit of a background regarding um, our, our study. So, we are um, focusing on this three high enrollment large um, courses um, here at LCC. So we are focusing on Psych 200, Econ 201, and Econ 202. Why? Because all sections of these courses adopted an OER. All sections, all uh, faculty teaching the course. And they did so in fall um, 2016. So more background about our study. So what we did was uh, we compared publisher textbook use for um, academic year 2015 to 2016 versus open textbook use um, for the, 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 the next semester, which is um, academic year 2016 to 2017, actually a full academic year. So what we did was, uh, we eliminated the confounding variable of the instructor. So what this means is that there is a one-on-one -on -one comparison of faculty teaching the course before OER and um, using an OER. So only faculty who, who taught in the semesters prior to OER and who taught using an open textbook are tracked. So there's this one-to-one -one correspondence between the faculty um, teaching those courses. And this is just a brief summary of our study population. So um, our control group are the non-OER and our treatment is the OER course. And we have um, 92 faculty in 239 um, sections and our N is um, 6,602. So we have a number of data collection strategies. Um, I do a student feedback survey every um, semester, and we have a rich um, data um, for that. Um, we also do faculty surveys of OER um, usage, and um, we employ a mixed method, um, quantitative and qualitative um, study. And as I mentioned, we got uh, the data for the student um, grades, withdrawal, drop, um, incomplete states from our Center for Data Science, which also acts as our institutional review board. Um, and they got that um, data from uh, Banner and Argos. Argos. So um, the research is largely based on the COO framework because we are um, uh, an open ed research fellow. That is the framework that we use when um, we study um, efficacy of OER usage. So it stands for cost, outcomes, use, and perception. And this study um, does all the four um, framework. Uh, so in terms of cost, um, these are the research questions that um, we were trying to find out. So how much money did our students um, save with using an open textbook? And how much money did they report as um, spending for these three courses? And then in terms of outcomes, we honed in on student grades, course withdrawal rate, persistence rate, and retention rate. 
So we compare the pre and um, the, the OER use. So in terms of um, usage, um, these are the questions that we were trying to find out in this research um, paper. So um, this corresponds to the questions that we have in our student feedback survey. And then for perceptions, um, we, we wanted to find out how our students perceive, uh, perceive the quality of the open textbooks. So a note here um, is that we only use students' perception. We did not um, use faculty perception just because there were semesters when um, we did not have data for that. So um, that's why we did not include that. So in terms of um, our research result, in terms of cost, um, yes, our students saved a lot with um, not having to um, buy the textbook um, because now they're using an OER. And um, as far as the question on the typical amount that our students spend on um, textbooks um, each semester, it usually range from 100 to 300. So that's where most of the, the responses were. Um, I mean, it, it, it may look small just because, again, our students are not buying textbooks. So, so this, this is really the finding that I would like to highlight. I understand this is heavily, uh, <laughs> you know, figure laden and um, and then I'll explain it in, in a little while. Um, but the thing that I'd like you to look at is the column where it says significance. So um, P is actually the significance indicator. Um, it tells us how reliable the statistic is or, um, you know, something that to tell us that the results did not happen by chance. Um, so it tells us how sure we are that a difference or relationship exists between OER and student outcomes. So a P that is of above 0 0.05 is an indicator that there is not a difference or a significant difference in student outcomes. When comparing um, uh, courses using an OER and um, courses that are using a publisher textbook. So, um, in short, there's no significant um, difference um, in terms of the rates when comparing um, the academic year 2015 to 2016, where these courses were using a publisher textbook and academic year 2016 to 2017 when these courses are, were now um, using um, OER. So for the course grades, again, it's the same. So the P is less than 0 0.05. There is no um, statistical uh, significant difference um, in terms of um, the rates um, when, when course grades are taken into account. And that's also the same with uh, persistence and retention. So retention is actually the number of students or the percentage of students that um, are returning from fall to fall and persistence is um, from fall to spring. So in terms of OER use uh, by number of faculty and number of students, these are the number of faculty that um, were using OER and the sections that were using OER. Um, there is a question in our survey um, asking, what is your intent to register for a course that uses an open textbook? And of course, our students say they are more likely to um, enroll in courses that are using um, OER. And if there's a choice between a course that is using an open textbook or a section that is using an open textbook and a section that is not using um, an OER, then of course our students say they will enroll in courses using um, OER. So this data here um, pertains to um, students' perceptions 
on the quality of um, the open textbook. And um, majority of them say that um, it's the same or better than traditional textbook. Or, and, and, and some say that it's better than the traditional textbook. So very small percentage say that um, it's quality is worse than um, the traditional textbook. So to summarize, so a recent analysis that looked at um, the two years, as you can, as you have seen, demonstrated that there's no significance between OER um, courses and those um, courses that were using um, publisher textbook in terms of student success metrics. So the only rate that we are seeing is a higher average in college retention. So um, we have seen a uh, 1.5 higher retention rate in, in our two-year analysis. But um, as what Karen will tell you, um, who's a, the director of our um, assessment here at LCC, um, it is, we cannot really make that, um, uh, you know, definitive uh, relationship that there is really, um, a significant difference unless we do uh, uh, longitudinal data. So I suspect if we analyze, so we now have about three academic years of um, OER usage. If we do that and include all courses, not just these three um, courses, we probably could see um, uh, a significant difference in favor of OER. So this is another um, thing that um, I, it was, it was just really an aha moment for me because um, as you can see, this is our fall 2018 enrollment data. And um, as you can see, our enrollment here at LCC is going down significantly. We used to be the third, um, uh, community college in Michigan in terms of enrollment, but now we have gone down to the fifth um, in terms of, of enrollment, number of um, students enrolled. Um, but if you can see the, the campus head counts for fall 20, uh, 2018, the unduplicated one, and if you compare the number of students that are enrolled this um, semester um, in our OER courses, 37% of our students um, currently enrolled in fall 2018 are um, taking OER courses and that is um, significant and I am um, predicting that by spring or certainly by fall 2019 we will be closer to our target of 50% of our students enrolled. Um, LCC would, will um, be enrolled in courses using OER. So again, this is a forthcoming paper. Um, we hope that this will be published soon and um, Karen is my co-author as I mentioned. Um, yeah, and this, this is the last slide. And if you have questions, just send me an email or I'll be happy to answer it if you have one during this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Thank you. Yeah, that was that great. Um, and I'm. Um, we we did have a few questions in the in the um, chat window. Uh, one was from Rich Hirschman. He asked, "Are these all OpenStax textbooks?" Um, say that say that again, because I was reading. So, are they OpenStax textbooks, or are they general OER? Um, yeah, those are all OpenStax. So our Econ 201 are using OpenStax as well as our Psych um, 200. Okay, great. Um, and Amy Ho Hoffer had a question. She said, um, in her in her um, reading, um, most studies don't cover the entire COOP framework. Um, is the, they take certain elements? Um, is and so she was wondering if that was unusual or. Um, Amy, not, not really unusual. Um, it's harder to cover the entire um, co framework, um, but uh, the one that I, I um, have right
right now out of memory just because I I'm, it's all fresh in my mind is um, a study by Christina Hendricks where um, they also did um, the, the full framework except their N is a little smaller than us. Um, there's also one um, study by Virginia Clinton. I think it was published just this year um, that uh, she did the full framework. Um, but what I see is that N is a little bit smaller than what have and certainly um, most of the studies that I see focus on just one semester versus an academic year comparison. So I think that is where um, the uniqueness of our study lies. Great. Um, and Rich had another question about your baseline cost number. Let's see. Uh, what was the baseline cost number to determine savings, new book or um, a different one? Um, actually, Rich, we do, I do two calculations. So I am making the assumption that our students uh, purchase the new um, edition of a textbook. So based on the assumption that our students will buy the new um, edition of the textbook, and then I have another figure that uses the $100 multiplier. And the cost of the new uh, textbook is based from what our um, bookstore uh, pricing um, is, and we have a third-party bookstore, it's MBS, direct. Oh. So on, on that same line, Rich had another clarification on that. He said, are, are the professors using off-the-shelf OpenStax or are they using customized versions of those materials? Okay, um, so for Econ 201, 202, they, they adopted what OpenStax um, you know, uh, offers. Um, for our site 200, it's the same. But for our um, sociology and for our um, math courses, they are actually now revising um, the open OpenStax um, textbook. Great. And um, had another question from Amy on, um, is your administration responsive to your enrollment retention related findings? Um, I have not really presented this yet to, to them, but um, I, I'm sure they will be, although I'm expecting that they'll probably ask the question of if there's no difference, then it means that it's not successful, right? And then I, I, one, of, one of the questions that I've um, received when I did a presentation um, when I did the same presentation at open ed this year was um, if you if you if your findings show that there's no uh, difference then how can I sell this to our administration and my answer was well it's still a win because think about it if our students were paying $150 for an econ textbook and now they are not paying anything because of OER and the results are the same, then what is that $100? So I think it's a win-win, even if there's no statistical significance or difference. Thank you. And we had um, a question, not necessarily directly uh, for you, Regina, but just in general from Michaela uh, Willie Hooper. Um, and. Um, even David or anyone in the audience could answer this. Um, she asked if there's any research um, that on faculty created um, uh, materials, uh, either a course um, versus OpenStax, and then where a print copy is readily available versus just online only. So she's looking for research along that, those lines. I don't know of any. Um... But what we do here at LCC is that we do not want to disadvantage our students who prefer to use the print. Um, you know, like I've, I've mentioned since fall 2015, we've been doing OER feedback research and um, it's consistent, consistent across um, semesters. When we ask our students, do you print um, materials, even chapters, even like the full book, what they say is that, um, I mean, the results indicate that only 10% of our students print. But again, we, we, we provide um, avenues for them to be able to do that. So we um, 
do a print on demand service. I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with Lulu. So lulu.com. Oh, so you, you provide a, a, a print on demand, a PDF of the OpenStax textbooks for students. Yes, yes. So um, I mean, even if they decide to buy um, OpenStax, you know, Amazon, it's, it's hardbound, colored, $35, depending on, on the textbook. I think the most expensive textbook for OpenStax is like 55 So okay. Wonderful. All right. I was just going to uh, jump in and say I also haven't heard any, anything like that, um, like Michaela is suggesting. But the one question that I would have is, you know, to try and limit um, like confounding variables, it seems like you would ideally want to have the same instructor in the same semester teaching with OpenStax versus a more customized version. Um, but then a follow up question, if, if anyone were to do this, which I think is a good idea, um, you know, I think oftentimes we are um, unintentionally equating OER with just more thoughtful teaching methods, right? Like if, if a survey result comes back that students outcomes improved when they're using OER, how do we know that it's because of the OER or it's just because that professor was for once in maybe 10 years being more thoughtful in how they're delivering their course material or, or anything like that, you know? Um, so that would just be my, my question of how to, make sure that's not um, being represented in, in this survey if that, or this research if it were to, if it were to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, David. And it is very hard to tease some of that out, um, what the faculty influence is um, from the OER itself. Would you agree with that, Regina? Yes, I do. And in fact, um, with, with um, our research, um, the the faculty who were teaching this course, like the OER course, didn't change anything. So um, they certainly the student learning outcome is the same. Um, they didn't, there was no redesign of the course now that the course is using an OER. But again, really, that is hard to isolate. Um, you know whether the the improvement or the decrease, um, you know, was due to the OER or. With, with the with the faculty and the best way that we can isolate that was to eliminate that so that's why we did um, the one-on-one -on -one correspondence you know only faculty teaching prior to OER and um, OER are um, track right all righty thank you for that I, there's some other comments going on in the chat window. I'm going to just very briefly um, switch here for a moment before we uh, come up on the hour. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me for that. I did not mean to do that. I wanted to let those of you out there in our audience know about Open Ed Week, which is coming up uh, the first week of March. And this is a great opportunity if you haven't participated in the past. It's the, the global celebration of open education worldwide about that impact uh, that open education can have on teaching and learning. And um, all of you are invited to participate. You can submit materials, uh, webinars. Uh, Etc. to the online schedule at the openeducationweek.org site. There's also promotional materials. If you want to do local events, you can download posters to create, um, you know, event announcements uh, happening right on your own campus. So great event. Hope you'll participate in that. We always have some special events that week for CCCOER and um, we also do a reflection on that and share some of the great things you, you did um, afterwards. Um, and let's see, just wanted to uh, say um, our uh, webinars are going into hiatus until February, but stay in the loop. Um, if you're not on our email list, uh, go ahead and get yourself added there under on our website at cccoer.org under Get Involved, community email. Love to hear from you. Happy holidays to everyone. And we're going to go back to Q&A for our two amazing presenters. Once again, big thanks to David Rose from American University and Regina Gong from Lansing Community College. All right, um, did anyone who wants to grab the microphone is welcome to do that. Um, 
or um, Regina or David, if you had any closing remarks, um, we're just hitting the hour, but I think we have time for one or two comments, if you have anything to say. Um, if you are interested to, to um, read about like different types of research, the Open Ed Group um, website is pretty useful for that, especially if you are trying to um, sell um, OER um, to your faculty. Because sometimes cost doesn't just cut it for them. You know, they want to know whether OER are effective in terms of um, what it brings to um, students. So that might be a good way for you to prove that OER indeed, um, you know, can help students learn and are uh, an effective um, way for them to um, essentially learn. So, yeah. Thank you. Maybe you oh, sorry, Regina. Um, yeah, I just uh, agree with everything Regina said. Uh, the Open Ed Group has been super helpful to me. Um, would highly recommend them for just your own uh, data findings um, or if you're considering doing the fellowship too. Um, but I mean, I just want to say thanks for Regina for inviting me here. Thanks for CCC OER and Una and Liz for hosting this. Um, and I'm happy to stick around if anyone has any questions. All right. Thank you both again for sharing all that. Uh, Wonder, those wonderful findings. Um, we put the, the website for Open Ed Group there. Um, we also love the Open Ed Group uh, research and, and the folks there. And we link to many of their research papers from our website as well. So thanks everyone. And we look forward to uh, talking with you in the new year, if not before. Have a great afternoon.